Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Dennis McDonald. Dr. McDonald, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Tim. Pleasure to meet you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and I hope everyone sees very shortly just the, the absolute amazing part that you are playing in so many of the discussions that so many of us are into about Christianity and its origins. Um, we're going to dive into that shortly, but I do want to give a brief bio for you, Dr. McDonald. Uh, you got a it looks like you went to Bob Jones University, just like I did. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I did. I want to ask you some questions about that shortly. You got your bachelor's at Bob Jones University, and then your master's at McCormick Theological Seminary, and your PhD at Harvard University. And Dr. McDonald also has taught New Testament and Christian origins at Goshen College, the, is it Iliff School? Iliff. Iliff School of Theology, and the Claremont School of Theology. Uh, he served as the director of the Institute for Antiquity and Christianity at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, he's been a visiting scholar at Harvard Divinity School and Union Theological Seminary. He served on editorial boards, uh, chaired many programs and societies and so forth. Uh, you've been on TV for, for your scholarship, people of, uh, like, such as PBS, the History Channel. And your scholarship is devoted in large part to Christian apocryphal writings, uh, to the synoptic problem, as well as the influence of classical Greek literature, especially the Homeric epics and Euripides and so forth on Jewish and early Christian narratives. And just a little bio here for your books, and then we'll dig in. Among your many publications, I don't think this list is, exhaust, is exhaustive, but uh, The Legend and the Apostle, There Is No Male and Female, Christianizing Homer, I'm just giving the, the beginning part of the titles here, The Homeric Epics and the Gospel of Mark, Mimesis and Intertextuality in Antiquity and Christianity, The Acts of Andrew and the Acts of Andrew and Matthias in the City of Cannibals, Does the New Testament Imitate Homer, Two Shipwrecked Gospels, and a bunch of other books, a bunch of other uh, works you've done. I got to just start before I pass the ball back to you to say, you are to many of us a hero and we thank you because the reason I say that is when you leave Christianity, I guess some people maybe just leave and say, I'm, I'm done and I don't care what it was. But for many of us for whom it was very real, very critical, it was our bread and butter, it was everything. We, we, we truly were trying to live our lives for Jesus and for the kingdom and the gospel. When we get out, there is the question of, we now that we know it's mythology, what, well, what was this thing that we were in that, that captured us for decades for many of us? And you have done an amazing work at helping us to understand a huge chunk of what is actually behind that, meaning the Homeric epics, uh, Euripides Bacchae, and things like that. So with that, we're going to dive into that in a little bit more detail, but I did want to pass the ball back just for your, your bio. Uh, just if you could tell us anything else about yourself that's maybe not more official, but any hobbies or anything else of interest, and then we'll dive more into your story. Tim, I'm just thrilled by that introduction. And my work has uh, attracted lots of criticism. And the fact that it's useful for some people like yourself is, it means everything to me. And, you know, I'm aging and I only have one major project uh, ahead of me and it's almost done. And I want to talk about that at some point. But yeah, I'm looking forward um, to hearing about it. What what drove me away from fundamentalism, I'll just say a little bit about this, was the way that uh, Bob Jones University responded to the death of Martin King Jr. And um, as you know, uh, Bob Jones has prayer meetings in the dormitories at night. And I wouldn't let people pray because um, the, of the way that people cheered when they heard that Martin King had, had died. They cheered, they stood and clapped. Wow. And I knew I that, was, that. that was not my religion. And they almost expelled me the next day because I was preventing prayer. Um, mm. I was accepted at Princeton Theological Seminary to do graduate work. And by the way, I wanted to be a Baptist pastor. I minored in Greek. I had taken Latin in high school. Um, I was kind of grooming myself to save the world for Christ. But I knew that I was that that religion was not going to be my religion. 
And so I took a job in California at a Baptist church um, at, at, to take a year off before going to Princeton. And during that time, Tim, I translated the entire Greek New Testament for myself. And doing so got me in touch with the moral values and the human wisdom of these texts. And I became, it became clear to me that almost every form of modern Christianity had lost those moral values and that moral horizon. And as part of my uh, growing up, I guess, I'd have to say, I, I'd like to say that I helped start the Sojourner magazine which was, um, a, it still is an evangelically oriented magazine that has leftist politics. And that was closer to what I understood the Christian gospel to be. But then I went to Harvard and became fascinated with um, uh, classics. And I always had been, even in high school, I was interested in these topics. And my minor was a Latin reception of Greek philosophy. So I was able to continue uh, the, the study of classics alongside the New Testament, but not classical poetry. Um, so that was a later development. I got a national endowment um, for the humanities grant to study oral traditions in the Acts of Andrew, which at the time existed only in fragments and not in a critical edition. And um, I was good at Greek and Latin and, and textual criticism. And so I decided that I would take my hand at trying to put that text together. And I was also at the same time interested in seeing if there was a Andrew tradition, the same way that there's a Pauline tradition or a Johannine tradition or a Petrine tradition. And it became clear to me there wasn't. And it became clear to the people that I worked with because of the grant at Indiana University at the Folklore Institute that traditional form criticism and redaction criticism and so on was not going to cut it with this text. And it occurred to me walking in a steamy night in Indiana before I drove home that a lot of what I was reading reminded me of Homer's Odyssey. But Tim, I hadn't read the Odyssey since I was in high school. I mean, I, I dabbled in some poetry at Harvard and so on. But the next morning, I delayed my return to, to Denver and bought a paperback copy, uh, a translation of the Odyssey, and unknown to the highway patrol of five states, I read it on my way home. And it blew my mind. Um, clearly, the author of the Acts of Andrew was portraying um, Andrew, whose name means manliness, by the way, as an alternative to Odysseus, to Achilles, to Heracles, and, and to Socrates, too. So it wasn't, it was also Plato that was informing him. And so I had two projects on the Acts of Andrew that took me a decade, Tim. One was the reconstruction of the text. And the other was to assess where these narratives come from and what analogies there were in classical literature, especially poetry. And so those issued in some of the books that you mentioned, the Acts of Andrew and the Acts of Andrew and Matthias and the City of the Cannibals is the reconstruction of the text. Christianizing Homer interprets it as um, a Christian interpolation. Well, during that time, I also studied uh, Greek rhetoric, um, the likes of Quintilian and the Progumnosmata and so on, to see how did people learn to write and what kind of literature are we talking about? And there are two categories that were very important. One was mimesis, that is imitation. So students would take a model that was successful and socially well-known, and they would write um, an imitation from it, often to rival it, to change its values or to parody it. And you can see this in Virgil's Aeneid. That's what Virgil is doing with Homeric epics. He's imitating, but he's changing. And the other category is synchrosis. Synchrosis simply is 
literary comparison of two characters to show that they share certain virtues, but in some cases, um, one of the characters is has uh, faults and the other one has virtues. And um, by comparing, for example, Julius Caesar with Alexander the Great, Philostratus is able to make the case that in some cases Julius Caesar was better, in some other cases Alexander the Great. And so people learned how to write narrative to show that their hero is not inferior to another hero, and in many cases has different virtues. And this is what was happening in the Acts of Andrew. But one day I was um, trying to organize a lecture on the Gospel of Mark for a large introductory course at Iliff School of Theology. And I had never been happy with Mark and the um, narrative explanations, um, and certainly not theological explanations. So um, I got up at 3.30 uh, in the morning, made myself a big pot of coffee, and gave myself a reading of the Gospel of Mark in Greek so that I would um, have something new to say for my lecture. It became immediately clear to me, Tim, that the Gospel of Mark was doing the same thing that the author of the Acts of Andrew did. Jesus sails on a ship on the little Sea of Galilee with people who are incompetent. He, he goes and talks to the dead. He has these feasts for thousands of people. You have that feast at the beginning of the Odyssey for thousands of people. You have the, the Jewish leaders are depicted like Penelope's suitors. They're greedy, they're murderous, and so on. Jesus dies very much like Hector. His God has abandoned him, just the way Apollo had abandoned um, Hector. You have uh, Joseph of Arimathea um, rescuing the corpse of Jesus, which is what Priam does at the end of the Iliad. He re rescues um, the, the, uh, the death of Hector. So uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea rescues Jesus's corpse, of course, and not the other way around. And the parallels went on and on and on. Now, Tim, that morning, I didn't have the courage to tell my seminary students what I had seen because I needed to digest it and to think it through in terms of what I'd studied about Greek rhetoric and, um, and also the Acts of Andrew. So um, I studied for a couple of weeks the following summer and became convinced that the author of the Gospel of Mark was portraying Jesus as an alternative hero to Greek heroes to show that he was more powerful, that he not, was not only like a Greek hero, he was like a Greek deity, that he could walk on the water, something Odysseus couldn't do, but Poseidon could do. Um, he, could, um, he could raise people from the dead, Greek heroes seldom did that, except for, you know, a, a, a few um, a magical uh, magicians. And so that's where the Homeric epics in the Gospel of Mark book came from. And so Can I just ask, I had, as, you, as you began to realize that, you were a Christian up to that point, correct? Yes. What did, did, did that seem like an immediate faith destroyer or how did how did you not just intellectually but emotionally respond to putting those pieces together realizing that the gospel which was supposedly telling the story of a real you know the real savior was actually just a, re a beautiful rewrite you know very well done rewrite but a, a rewrite of much much older stories what did that do to your faith when you began to process that it enlivened it. it. It yes, it destroyed the, the mythologies that I'd grown up with as a fundamentalist, right? And as the a Bob Jones graduate, but now I understood what these texts were doing. Now I understand how their moral vision was played out. They're trying to show Jesus to be more compassionate, 
than the likes of Odysseus and Achilles. This is a message I wanted my seminarians to imbibe and to preach. Now, uh, that you don't need a god in order to find in literature insight and human imagination and ethical commitments. So this emboldened my Christian identity, but it made me altogether suspicious of organized Christianity. So there was a moral vision and a beauty to these texts that the Christian church had not appreciated. Now, I called myself in our, in our opening comments a, um, a Christian atheist. And what that means is, I think these texts are wonderful. I think they are creative um, and, and ethical masterpieces in a way. They're classics. And when they talk about God, God is simply a character in a narrative that they're using to, to structure reality for themselves. And that's okay. I don't care if people are atheists or theists. I want to know what that does for human life. What does it do for the planet? What does it do for gender? What does it have to do with... So the issue that these people, these authors, and they don't agree with each other, these authors are variously construing the Jesus mythology to meet the social and political needs of their time. And that is some, so uh, I think that that moral um, feature of early Christian narrative is very hard for some people to understand unless they think it's the word of God. When you look at that, I mean, I know what you mean when you say you're, you know, you were still a Christian in a sense, but it was more of the mor morality. You weren't still at that point, I assume, is expecting when you, uh, when your time is up to stand before God and for God to say, why should I let you into heaven? And you would claim Jesus is my righteousness. That was, that was losing its ground very quickly, I assume, at that point. Well, I'd lost that 10 years before. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, go, I'll come back to that. I do want to ask you more about that, but staying no, on no, track. Ask it, ask it now, please. What, what was that like in, in, at that point then when, when you were like, what, what got you out of it? Because if you were truly in it, and I assume, you know, a lot of people, I know I'm sure people went to Bob Jones for various reasons, such as, you know, your parents, parents said it's Bob Jones or Pensacola that's, Christian that's College. That's what I did. That's what yeah. happened to me. Um, no, no real choice there. And then, um, you know, but there are a lot of people that go because they really just, they want to turn the world upside down for the Lord. And if you were in that camp, and I'd love you to clarify, you know, if that was true, but what, what possibly started the ball rolling, if it wasn't, you know, Memphis's criticism and all that, what got the ball rolling for you to no longer believe in Jesus as your savior or to just to think that this whole thing wasn't real? I think it was my translating of the New Testament before going to seminary to realize that these are texts by flawed human beings with social commitments and with differing moral visions. And they talk about God because God is a part of their discourse. But that I actually honestly think theology is boring, to be honest with you. And I think God talk is just uninteresting. Yeah. So God is interesting to me when God appears in a narrative and people are using God as a deus ex machina to explain something in the narrative. Now, I know mm -hmm. that's um, heretical for some people, but I just, uh, I get really quite impatient with theology. I think the real issue is sociology and politics. You know, what, what I, what drives my giving budget is not to religious causes. It's to social, it's to the environment, it's to um, um, left-wing political causes, honestly. Yeah. What Can I ask, before we go, go back to the uh, mimesis topic, when you did go through that experience and you were, you know, your faith was radically changing, was there a specific point at which 
you said, man, I just, I'm, I'm out. Like whatever system I was in, this isn't real anymore. I'm, I'm out. Was it a, a day, a week? Was it a whole you know, year, season of your life? What was that like? And was it emotionally difficult to shift, especially in terms of questions like what happens when I die? Um, how did that pan out for you? It was not an issue for me, but it was an issue more for people who knew me and were giving me a paycheck. Mm. So um, I was released from a number of jobs because I wasn't playing ball with them. So my alienation was not with God. It wasn't with Jesus. It was with the institutions that I thought um, weren't playing fair and were not embodying the values that were, were important to me. So mm. it was really a gradual process. And I think um, in a way, Tim, it was institutions that made me realize that I was an atheist more than anything that came out of my soul. That's so interesting. I, if I could just make a quick comment about the Bob Jones situation. I didn't see that up close, that kind of stuff too close. Um, I was there for just one year, my freshman year of college, and then I transferred to a school in Pennsylvania, which was comparatively much more liberal. Uh, but but ultimately still pretty conservative, called Lancaster Bible College, yeah. uh, not far from Harrisburg, and studied to be a pastor. But when I was at Bob Jones for a year, the biggest thing I saw, of course, was the whole don't do interracial dating. And it was funny, but after I left, I, I was saw a news article that said at, at one point, one of the um, Bushes had come, President Bushes had come to speak at the college. And I guess he hadn't, which everyone spoke there, hadn't been aware of their no interracial dating policy. And apparently he went to their, you know, chapel and spoke and, you know, had all the accolades and everybody was happy. But then the news broke out, hey, he went and spoke at this school where they said you can't do this. And so he he had to distance himself from the school and say, you know, that's, you know, I don't agree with that. And apparently after the school had had that policy for decades and decades and decades, they suddenly changed it all of a sudden mm. over political pressure. And that did really shake me up a little bit. That certainly didn't kill my faith. Um, it, it took this kind of stuff, the mimesis, the, the, um, seeing the, the heavy-duty quotes of Enoch come, you know, woven into the, into the New Testament, um, seeing the, the Greco-Roman mystery cults, all that stuff, um, comparative mythology. But it was like one of those seeds, perhaps you'd call it, where I'm like, eh, if you really believe that that's true, how does it shift? And, and, and maybe the bigger question is, if, if you really have the Spirit of God, how is the spirit of God being so confusing to such a mass group of people? Um, and of course, the whole curse of Ham uh, thing was a big deal as well, which I don't know if that was officially their stance, but I think a lot of people there believed in the curse yeah, of Ham. Yeah, they did, yeah. So anyway, it was interesting. I will give him one, I will do one good plug for Bob Jones, and this is about the only good plug I could give for him. They have a huge art gallery. Did you ever get Isn't to go it there? It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. And also their music and yes. their, their drama was good. I got involved with all of that. I'm a musician. Mm. So, um, it, and, and I've done some stage work. No, yep. it, in the arts. Now, where that comes from, Tim, and you know this, but probably your viewers don't. Bob Jones wanted to be the flagship of um, fundamentalism and Southern culture. But it didn't like the way that the church had been understood, like hee haw and banjo music and, um, you know, iced tea and grits. Um, so they tried to um, up the social uh, register of being a fundamentalist. So to be a fundamentalist doesn't mean you don't like art, it doesn't mean that you don't know how to play music. It doesn't mean that you don't understand Shakespeare. So this is a, um, it, it's, so they, they are cultured, but it's um, to improve their, the interpretation of Southern religion so that isn't, um, you know, corn paw. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I, I actually got to work here. I was one of the art gallery guards for a while. And what my claim to fame there is I actually guarded, uh, I think it was five or six Rembrandts at one point. And I was just 
it was, you know, there were seasons where the art gallery would be busy, but a lot of times it would be very, very quiet and almost no one there. And I just stand there for hours and just stare at Rembrandts and guard them, so to speak. It was very cool. Very, very fun experience. Well, let, let, let me let me come to something. Please. I don't think organized Christianity understands the power of art. And it's you were talking about the visual arts. Um, I'd like to talk a little more about the poetic arts, how mm. important Greek poetry was to ancient culture, how important music can be in, um, in establishing um, uh, you know, one's emotions and uh, relationships and even nationality. And uh, this is, I, I have in my date book every week at the top of the page, the statement may create something beautiful. And that is how I would want my epitaph to read. He tried to create something beautiful. And if my work has uh, makes people happy or if it's useful, I think it's because I'm trying to find something beautiful in these texts that is useful and that is more liberative than the way they've often been read. Can I ask with that on that note, as you as you took that to the level that you did, meaning you eventually wove this into the Acts of Andrew, you uncovered that this was in Mark and other Gospels. You, you mentioned to me that you would still consider yourself in a sense a Christian, but more in the sense of just the morality and the, the, maybe the cultural side of it. But for a lot of us, when we read your work, when we see what you've uncovered, and I know you're not claiming that every last minutia of what you've you know, put forward is, is, is uh, has to be the, the right interpretation, but a lot of it is pretty waterproof in our opinion. Um, and I love what you've done, by the way, with, with uh, Derek through Myth Vision and Neil with Gnostic Informant. I'll, I'll have links to some of those videos beneath our video so people can go check out the great work we're talking about, but, and as well as your links to your books on Amazon. But for a lot of us, when we read that and we think these gospels, and, and Mark most likely from what I understand was the first one and the others, you know, leveraged it to write their gospels. But the gospel of Mark, whoever wrote that was copying and, and imitating and rewriting Greek epics and Greek poetry. For a lot of us, when we see that, we just think that's amazing literarily, but in terms of it being truth, pardon the expression, but this is bullshit. <laughs> this is not reality. If they're using the Iliad and the Odyssey and Euripides Bacchae to rewrite stories of Odysseus and the other gods in the Greek pantheon and, and Dionysius, then this stuff isn't real. I mean, did, did it have that effect on you or did you, were you just in all of the, more in all the literary factors that came into play? Or? This is a huge issue, Tim, and we're getting into theology. And I told you, I don't like theology very well, <laughs> but no, 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 on the spot. But no, but let me respond to it. I yeah, don't go do. to church. I don't pray. I think the Christian tradition has become an elaborate con. And um, that doesn't mean that I'm not Christian identified. It doesn't mean that the church hasn't done marvelous things. It doesn't mean that these texts haven't generated art and beauty and, and sustained people in times that are difficult. Now, when you say that Mark has done these things, yes, Mark is not telling the truth about reality. He's telling his truth. He's creating tradition. He's attempting to give his audience that's suffered after the Jewish war reason to hope and a way of valorizing suffering. Not very different from the way Martin King had tried to help African Americans understand suffering in, um, because of the civil rights movement. Now, that doesn't mean that everything Martin King stood for was, uh, was real, 
but it was true to a lot of people. It was true to him. And I think we need to unhinge the question of fact and truth. Yes, these things are not factual. So if we expect religion to be built on historical fact, virtually every religion is going to fail. But what truth are they getting to? What, um, what values are they standing for? And I find it very useful, Tim, to um, use social dynamic theory, um, called uh, social identity theory, as a way of teasing this out. We all live in societies in which we I have identities. So you and your viewers have an identity. Let's call that the stereotyped in-group. In so you can describe more or less what the people who watch your podcast are committed to. We also know, or you would know better than I, who the outgroups are and um, how you are creating um, boundaries between your in-group and the values that you have and the out-group. We all live in those kinds of things. So when we look at the New Testament, let's not ask about God. Let's not ask about truth. Let's not ask about history. Let's ask about who's the in-group, who's the out-group. Who's the prototypical leader of the in-group? What are the things that are contested between the in-groups and the out-groups? And by the way, that is usually uh, crafted in these texts as theological. God wants this and, and you're of the devil and so on. That's what's called social identity name calling. So um, yes, these are not factual. But for the people who wrote them and many who received them, they are truthful. And myth is not the opposite of fact. Uh, and it's not the opposite of truth. It's the way people frame their truths to make it um, attractive and coherent. So um, I really think we need to turn from theology to aesthetics and to sociology for, and not psychology. I think that's a, a, a false start, but I think the, the sociology. So for example, I haven't done the, the Enoch uh, gospel stuff like you have, but my challenge to you would be, what do we know about the social identity of the Enochic community? Um, who are the, what is the out group and how do these materials get reprocessed in order to address different kinds of social identity situations. So Mark's social identity is different from Q's, is different from the Gospel of John. And that goes a long way to help one understand why the narrative is constructed the way it is. Jesus uh, has different faces in those groups. Why? Because these groups have used him as a prototypical leader for the in-group values. Now, I talk about this a lot in some recent work. So um, I guess this is a, a, you know, a clandestine promotion of my yeah. uh, research. Well, before you go too deep in that, can I ask you a few questions about what yeah, you've been course, yeah. saying? Um, and I've, I've got a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll keep it to two or three here. Number one, um, I wanted to ask about just less about the, the scholarship side and more about what you just said about truth and, and myth and all that. People like myself are working hard, very hard, hopefully a lot harder soon, to do what we can to expose Christianity as a mythological worldview that needs to not be taught to children because it is psychologically abusive to tell kids you are a sinner and that there's a God named Yahweh who technically loves you, but if you don't love him back, he'll burn you forever, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, blood magic will save you. Believe in Jesus, his blood and death and resurrection will be your salvation and you will get to glory. Um, we look at that and we say that is psychologically abusive to children. And this, Absolutely. this, needs, this needs to Absolutely. end. Absolutely, right. And, and like, I, I know what you mean when you said it, it, religion gives people some hope. And I would certainly not try to deconvert someone on their 
deathbed if they you know if they're like I've just I you know I've got uh, two weeks to live and you know the doctors have told me you know that's it I, I'm like if you know, I'm just clinging to Jesus now have your two weeks of clinging to Jesus but in terms of like just the future of our planet I really want to do that and so I was curious do you feel now now that you've obviously done a lot of work on a lot of levels both academic and and just emotional thinking through these issues do you feel like christianity and religion and not not just christianity but religion in general needs to end in our world do you feel like we would be better off as a species if we were much less mythologically oriented in our worldviews uh, well in fact religion is toxic yeah worldwide Agreed. It's responsible for so, and this is what happens when social identity becomes reified or objectified, that we have the truth and you do not have the truth. This is why all claims to revelation are insidious and are driven by um, cultural arrogance and often vested interests and so on. I have no interest in the continuity of, the, um, of any of these institutions. So, um, but I think it would be unfortunate if we didn't see where th those institutions can are are potentially valuable. And they've got a lot of money, honestly, Tim. And I'm working with someone right now, in fact, who's trying to talk um, Methodists into having target churches where it's where God is optional. You, you know, you bring your family here. We'll talk about what's going on in the world. You know, we'll uh, bring groceries to people who are needy. We'll plant trees and so on. But just don't worry about God. Don't worry about salvation, except for the salvation of the planet. So it's the Unitarian, isn't it? No, it isn't, actually. It's not? Because okay. Unitarians often still believe in God. Okay. They just are universalists. There are, you know, there the Muslims have their God, what's the same God as other people. So there yeah, are some true. Unitarians who are true atheists. That's right. But there are, uh, I think most of them are more universalists. Um, mm -hmm. So this is now, I told him myself that I think it's a failed attempt. I just don't think it's going to happen. But I think it's much more important to be rigorously and morally humanist mm -hmm. what does it mean to be a human being in the 21st century when our earth is frying what does it mean when religion is used to bolster um, prejudice and violence and war um, and so we really have to pull the my uh, i haven't told many people this tim but i'm going to tell you my academic work is my contribution to culture wars. Mm. And that's my way of depriving people who think God has spoken once and for all in scripture, and we can defend it with um, AR-15s and so on. Uh-uh, that's not what's going on. These are texts that are struggling to make God talk real to communities that are suffering. And um, I think we don't want to give up on that moral vision just because we are pissed off about religion. Well said, well said. Continuing with uh, just a couple of these side questions before we get back to your um, upcoming book. When you talk about the Homeric epics being uh, the source for, for a lot of the stories, either in terms of themes or at times even to the point where they're, you know, copying words and, and quoting. But the, this uh, re, imis, imitation, this um, taking a, an old story and rewriting it or even flipping it on its head to, to change the narrative, to, to say our savior figure is, is much better than your hero. When we talk about it now, we're, we're just talking about it, like how did they come up with this text? But the original people that did it, whoever did this, when they, if they're, if I'm going to make an assumption that you're not a mythicist, um, I, I think I've heard you say that you're not. So if, if they knew that there was a guy, and then the, and someone comes along with this book that says he did all these things, 
And some people would say, well, I, I wasn't there, but I know some people that claim to, to know somebody that was there, and I've never heard these stories before. This doesn't sound right. I don't think he did these things. Where did you come up with this stuff? And for the people that knew the Homeric epics, they could, of course, say, I know what you're doing there. You're, I, can, I can see that. For the people that didn't know th those, those stories, they would say, this doesn't sound like anything I've heard before. Where are you getting this from? How did they get that past everybody and, and people not say, wait a second, this is not the real Jesus? We knew this or we heard about this guy enough to know these, you're pulling these stories out of thin air. From our perspective, this is not Jesus. You could make up someone else if you want to call him, you know, Charlie. Charlie did this stuff, but this is, we know there's a real Jesus and he did some stuff. He was a great teacher. He was this, he was that, but he wasn't this book. He wasn't Mark. He wasn't the Gospel of Mark. How did they, how did they got people to ex accept it? I mean, I know the Gnostic flavor where it's like it's not meant to be about him, it's meant to be about the, you know, the seasons of the soul. But ignoring that, for the people that took it literally, how do you think it, they got that over that edge without them just everyone saying, we know this isn't true. What do you, where is this from? Uh, again, you use the word true as though it were factual, mm. right? So they, for them, it's true because um, th that this, these depictions of Jesus show him to be better than the deities and the heroes that are around them. So in antiquity, people had different thresholds for historical reliability. And their threshold for reliability often had to do with claims of um, a, a personal testimony and so on, which is related to what you're saying. But a fascinating piece of this is often overlooked in um, the writings of the elder John. He's the one who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He's known by Papias, and, and he is called a mathetes himself, that his, he was someone who knew Jesus himself. He probably was an exile after the Jewish war and um, became a missionary or a church planter of sorts in Western Asia Minor. And he writes these letters to his churches and later on people ascribe the fourth gospel to him. He just um, is, he and Papias, who is our earliest reference to um, this John the Elder, accept the Gospels of Mark and Matthew on the basis of um, their witness, th that, that they, they saw it. So they, curiously enough, I mean, we would not buy it, but for them, these were um, considered um, valuable texts, and they articulated very early on some of the values of their communities. Um, I think one of the things that is different from, for us is that we emphasize the narratives. And for Papias and John the Elder, they actually emphasize the teachings and the sayings. And um, these are the ones that get picked up, for example, in um, the Johannine epistles. If the author knows the Matthew and Mark, and probably Q in my view, why is it they say have almost nothing to say about these miraculous narratives? And it's all about um, ethics. It's the, it's the sayings tradition that really matters to them. And, these, and even in the fragments we have of Papias, there's very little uh, that's related to their narratives of these sensational things. So I, your, your question is really right on target, Tim, and it's a, it's a difficult one to ask. I think the most important thing to say is our threshold about what is realistic and scientific and historical did not matter to them in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, Can I ask who, who you think did it? Who do you think actually wove this Homeric epics into these Gospels? Have you ever... Um, Thought about that and who taking the best guess? I'm not, I should say, it might not be one person, but which person or group might have done it and where they were? 
this is going to shock you. And because I know you're uh, possibly a Q skeptic. Um, you I'm ambivalent imita- on that one. <laughs> no, no. You have, you have imitations. If there is a Q document, you have imitations of Homeric epic already there. Um, Telemachus is, is visited by Athena and he learns that he is indeed Odysseus's son. He goes out immediately and challenges the suitors in order to establish his father's kingdom. Um, what about the, the parables? Uh, there's a man who um, puts his servants in charge and goes off for a long time and then comes back and requires his servants to be obedient uh, if, while he was absent and one of them wasn't and so he cuts them to pieces. Read the Odyssey. Mm-hmm. That's what Odysseus does. He goes on. And this is the Q document already. And mm-hmm. so Jesus already is a Greek hero, but he's also the prophet like Moses, who is going to be more compassionate than the Moses of Deuteronomy, for example. So um, the, the, here's something that I'd love your viewers to think about. In the period we're talking about, to the year 200, we have five fragments of the Septuagint, five fragments. We have over 600 of Homeric epics. BC, right? No, CD, up okay. to, to the year 200. Okay. Um, from, the, from the period of 200 BCE to 200 Common Era, you have over 600 fragments of Homer, and you have five of the Septuagint. Now, which texts are Christians likely to have known? Which ones were used in schools? Which ones were in their artwork? Which ones are contested in philosophy? They're not talking about Moses. They're talking about Odysseus and Hector. What's what's going on in Virgil? So we have had amnesia about the Greco-Roman side mostly because the Gospels appear at the end of the Hebrew Bible. So those are the intertexts we're interested in, but their intertexts were what they learned in school, what they saw on the theater, in the theater, what they saw uh, at the temples. And so we have this deep amnesia about classical Greek culture, that, that if we could recover, we'd appreciate these texts so much more. Now, they're not the word of God. They're not revelations, and you're not going to get saved by them. And you certainly shouldn't tell that to children, for pity six. On the other hand, um, for the people that read them, they were life-giving, and they were sustaining, and they caused people to come together in this social identity bonding. Do you do you have any guesses as to who who actually did it in the sense of was it a group of I know it was a huge group of Jews in, in Alexandria where there was a huge library there were other locations do you have any guesses as to who might have actually put forth the first gospel that we know of as Mark or oh, no, the, the gospel of the Q, Q document the earliest gospels almost certainly were if Q if there was one. Mark and Matthew, and they all come out of a relatively bilingual environment with Aramaic and um, Greek. Now, that's more likely in the Levant than anywhere else. And also, two of these texts are very concerned with the Jewish war. Well, the Jewish war is something that affected the Levant in a way that it never was an issue in, in Egypt. It never was a, an issue in the same way in um, in uh, Turkey or Asia Minor. So surely these things came out of the, the, those areas, but they did not come out of community life. They came out of intellectuals. These things, um, in order for these authors to be able to do what they do, and to use the rhetorical devices they do, they have been educated. And they're not transmitting tradition, Tim. 
they're creating tradition. These mm -hmm. are not recorders, they're transformers. They're, mm -hmm. they're the ones who are creating these traditions and they know each other and they think the previous ones didn't get it quite right and that's why they're revising it. So there's something built into the synoptic tradition that should make you suspicious, namely that nobody likes what the previous person did or wasn't entirely accurate. Yeah. Do you, when, when you look at some of the people that were, I mean, obviously there's going to be people from that era that we just don't know. They're lost to history, but people that we do know, you know, Plutarch, Philo, Josephus, on and on the list could go. Um, who, whoever the big hitters were of that era, do you think any of them that you know of could have been behind some of this? No. Okay. No. Gotcha. It's, but it's one of my biggest questions in my mind is the more that we dig and, and figure out what they did, it makes me think, well, we, we kind of have this, you know, uh, just a sign that says they did it, you know, they, who, who was the they? And it, it does seem like it's a question that it, it's hard, really hard to answer. Um, it seems like there's some, I've seen some really good reasons to believe it might've had something to do with Alexandria, but, you know, those arguments are just one of, you know, many. And I'd really love to hear someday a good argument from someone that's, you know, I, I, I couldn't put, put forth one myself, but I'd love to figure out who did this because it, it, I guess I'm hopeful that it might illuminate a little bit about the reasoning as to why they did it versus um, simply writing the story of his, his life, you know, or maybe, maybe someone did like, what was, who was the actual Jesus? What was the real guy doing? I know we've got some, you know, some sayings from him, but, but what was his actual life like? And I don't think we've got too much of that left, being that we can pull most of it out of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and so forth. And I'm, I'm, I'd, love to, I'd love to dream that someday I'll have a little, little answer to that. <laughs> we'll find okay, out. Okay, well, I'll give you an answer to it so right now, Tim. Yeah, I'll take your answer. I'm, as you know, a big, influ uh, a big believer in the Q document. Now, you don't have to believe in my cue or any cue, but you have to say that not everything in the New Testament Gospels can be explained by mimesis of Greek poetry or philosophy. Mm -hmm. So what is there and what is left? Now, that material comes out of a different social identity situation. In that case, the issue is what is the status of Mosaic Torah for Jesus and his followers. And this is where you get the debates with Pharisees and the demonization of Pharisees. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. He allows the healing of grain on the Sabbath. And this saying um, that you have in Matthew and Luke probably comes from Q, the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. After that, the kingdom of God is in force. Now, what that means is that's a attribution to Jesus that the law and the prophets are in the past and something new is happening with Jesus and his message. Now, I don't know that Jesus said that, but I do know that if you then go over to Paul, Paul also is convinced that Jesus is the end of the law and that there is now a new uh, dispensation, if you will, um, between God and humankind that is not built on Torah observance alone. Now, um, where does that insight come from? And in a little, um, uh, I don't, there's a passage in Josephus, not about Jesus, but about James the Just, that says the same thing, that James the Just was killed by certain people who were very strict on the law, but others who were more generous to the law said, no, that they're, they're fine. In other words, the Jesus movement, including James the Just, is in a kind of marginal position between Torah observance and Torah uh, um, flexibility. Now, there you have Josephus, you have Paul, you have Q, and in my view, that's all coming from early Jesus tradition and who started it. Well, everybody's saying that it came from Jesus. So Jesus must have been, in my view, Jesus was a social reformer who saw that Torah observance 
was harming marginal people. It was harming women, it was harming, you know, who were sinners, it was harm, um, hurting people who were hungry, and, the, and Jesus was a representative. Now, this is mythologized already. I'm not talking about a historical, these historical stuff, but he represented something very much like Cesar Chavez to his people and was confronted was confronting the authorities in order to make life more habitable for the people that he was um, committed to and, and they're listed there the, the 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 blind the lame the the sinners i came to call tax collectors and sinners not the righteous that's in the q document so i think mm. if you want to know something about jesus you have to start with his challenging the social identity of Palestinian Jews who were counting on Torah observance to get them out of Roman clutches. And he's not against Torah observance, but hey, Torah observance is hurting all these people. And that's not what Mosaic law should be about. So the law and the prophets are until John, who's a, who's a radical ascetic. I mean, he's, a, you know, he's a, he doesn't go to parties. Um, Jesus, you know, drinks with um, with sinners and tax collectors. You know, he's the party animal. Why? Because he's trying to reach them uh, for the kingdom of God in a way that is not oppressed. Now, this sounds theological. I really mean it to be sociological. These theological terms are used in order to establish an alternative Christian identity for Jews in their interpretation of law. So that law, and by the way, the passage about Jesus writing in the dirt and freeing the woman um, is in my Q document. Um, so um, that's, and why does he do it? Because the, the elders are trying to, to uh, stone this woman um, you know, who admits she's a sinner basically she never repents and jesus writes in in the he writes the commandment in the dirt to show that it's not written in stone it's written in the dirt so it's flexible unlike the law of bob jones by the way exactly well um by the way i think we have a small lag in our in video so i'm uh, i'll try to edit with that but um would you say then that it's fair to say that those original Jewish communities that would have followed Jesus and Paul, that they would have been educated enough in the Homeric epics, most likely, to have done this? Or would it have taken an outside source, do you think? I'm not familiar with how, how much the, you know, the Jewish communities would have been influenced by them. Was the syncretism, I think, thick enough that they would have easily been able to do that? Well, uh, that's a very good question. And the curious thing is that the author of the Q document doesn't want people to see those Homeric uh, elements. Mm. He's using them on his own to create his, he's not trying to say Jesus is like uh, Odysseus. He's trying to say Jesus is better than Moses. So, um, but he uses these tropes that are available in, you know, literary education in antiquity in order to do it. So he didn't, I'm sure he didn't want any of his readers to see what he had done. Now, Mark may have seen it. And Mark said, hey, that's a cool idea. I bet I can, you know, expand on that. So Mark expected his readers to be able to, uh, to, to see the opposition, not because they knew Homer well, but because they lived in a culture that was influenced by Homer and Greek mythology. Um, so for his re for for Mark, Homer was a text. For his readers, Homer was radiation, cultural radiation. Mm. It was as Hegel put it, Homer is the oxygen that Greeks breathed. Mm. Makes sense. Uh, before we get into your um your your pending work here, I did just want to make one comment, and it's it's more of a, a kind of going back to where I started from a, a thank you for hopefully on behalf of a lot of people. But one of the things that I love about what you've done with this work, and I know we're kind of talking around a lot of it. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people know 
what we're talking about. But, um, you know, again, just in a nutshell, the, the Gospels imitating the Homeric epics and, and other Greek literature, um, not copying it in the sense of just literally quoting it, although they do that sometimes, but more of a response to it and rewriting it. But when you do that, one of the things that you, the benefit of it that kind of comes down to us in the current day now, you, now that you've exposed this so much, is that it really does help us to, to help, I hope, I would say, I'd like to say help people, but I hope, I hope we help people to, to really see that this is just mythology in the sense that it doesn't mean, again, that there's nothing good in it. You know, I think you've pointed that out, but there's some, there's some morality that we can take from Christianity that we could apply, um, turn the other cheek, um, you know, a soft answer turns away wrath from the Old Testament. There's some, some principles that, that are good there, but in terms of saying, this is history, this is a literal book, and you need to literally believe that this is the Son of God and His death and resurrection and His blood saves you. As you start to identify some of these stories, what I think is really cool is that you can actually, if, as you get more and more educated on them as a, as a layperson, you get more well-read about works like yours. Every time they bring up a story, you can begin to just pull it apart and say, I can tell you where that came from. Exactly. I, I got to share this with you, too, because I think you'd be proud of this. Um, my kids uh, can come home from the church that uh, their mother takes them to, and they'll tell me a story. Jesus walked on water. Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus did this. Jesus did that. They know more at age five, six, seven about the origin story of this mythology than I did as a graduate of a Bible college, a very, very well-respected Bible college. I was ready to go into the pastorate. I didn't know squat about where this book came from. My seven-year-old son can tell you all about it, all about it. And I know it's more than just the Greek epic. It's other stuff, you know, compared to mythology, the Greek, Greek, um, Greek and Roman mystery cults. There's a lot there. And, and then, you know, I teach them about that stuff too. But I love, this is where I, I kind of get a smile on my face when I can actually tell them. And I love the, the piece you did about um, Hermes with the golden slippers uh, walking on the water. Remember that? I yeah, I sure. Book doesn't, but, you know, just the idea of, you know, Jesus sees, sees them from, he's on the mountain and he sees them. And, you know, Zeus is on the mountain and he sends Hermes. Jesus walks in the water. Hermes with his golden slippers walks in the water. As, there, as Hermes approaches them, they're terrified. As Jesus approaches the disciples, they're terrified. Just the whole thing. And, and I get, a little, honestly, a little twinkle in my eye when I think my kids know from the earliest days this is mythology. And they, they cannot just say it sounds like mythology. They can actually tell you where it came from, which is so I, cool. Uh, my, when my son was 13... He said, Dad, I know you teach, but I don't know what you teach. So tell me what you teach. And I said, I've got a deal for you. We're going to spend a week. And instead of reading to you before you go to bed, I'm going to tell you two stories. And one is from Greek mythology and the other is from the Bible. And I love it. So I told him one story and then told another story. And I asked him to compare them. And so we did. And then we did that for five nights. And on the sixth night, um, we did it again. And I said, hey, Julian, I think we've done it enough. I want you to know that very few people have seen the parallels between the stories that we've been looking at. And he says, I can't believe that, Dad. He said, no, no, that, that really is true. And we talked a little bit why that was. And I said, which stories did you like better? And he said, oh, I like the Greek stories so much better than the Bible ones. And then I said, I do too. But I want you to ask, which hero do you want to be to have your life more like? The stories about Jesus or the stories about Greek heroes? And he thought, no, it's about Jesus. I, I want to be more like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, and the reason I want to spin out of that just a little bit, one of the things I hope my work does is give people a new appreciation of Greek poetry. It's beautiful 
it's profound. It's a cultural classic. And I, I've had several people say, I would never have known about Homer had I not known about Jesus first and then read your stuff. Because now I know more about this wonderful literature. And the same thing's true of the Bacchae. What an amazing play that is. But if you read it, um, uh, when you read the Gospel of John and you see those parallels, you can see why the author is trying to make Jesus a better hero than the, um, the, the, the death-producing um, Ripides. So um, I appreciate very much that some people are getting some benefit out of understanding these things mythologically, but not just to understand the Bible, but also to understand Greek poetry better. Mm. Um, and I do want to introduce my volumes now. I've yeah, been please. working for a long time on a mimetic synopsis that has three, comes in three volumes. The first is a, a mimetic synopsis of Q, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And they're actually set up in parallel columns with my translation of every word in the Synoptic Gospels, my reconstruction of Q, and lengthy introductions and excursus of my translations of Greek poetry so that you can see um, the story that you had about Hermes and so on coming down. I give my translation of that and uh, with relatively little commentary. I just want people to see the texts um, back to back and to make their own judgments. The second volume is called a mimetic synchrosis of the Acts of the Apostles in Greek poetry. And the third is a, a mimetic synopsis of three Gospels of John where I unbraid the three levels of composition of the Gospel of John and argue that the earliest one pretend, um, is an imitation of the Bacchae. It knows the synoptics, but it wants to make Jesus a donor deity the same way that uh, Dionysus is. Now, I'm going to hold up one of the volumes. I don't know if you can see this. I guess you can. Yep, um, yep. And you can see how thick it is. That's double double sided. It's uh, 340 pages. The mm. second one is volumes two and three. And this has every verse of the Gospels and most of the Acts of the Apostles presented with their parallels in Greek poetry. And these are going to be made available at a relatively inexpensive price for hard copy and within about a year free as PDFs. And what I'm trying to do is to say that this is um, a gift to uh, the people who are curious. And by the way, I think you and I are now called duns. It's we're done with organized religion, but we have a fascination with these texts, a curiosity and a, a, a need to kind of reprogram um, our traditions. So I don't know where that's going to lead. And that's not my job. My job is, I think, to be a pioneer of a certain way of comparing Greek poetry and early Christian texts to give us a new appreciation of the moral vision that these authors had and their creativity. I love it. And I think it's fair to say, just based on what I've seen of your books and your interviews and what you're saying from those volumes, that this imitation dynamic, we're not talking about a few of the key passages in the Gospels. The examples go on and on and on and on. I mean, it's just feels endless. And I think you mentioned this with one of your interviews with, with Neil uh, on Gnostic Informant. But once you kind of train your mind to see it, a lot things start to pop even more because you, you, you've, you've suddenly got the, the right primer, the right grid to see it through. Is that fair and to say? I've not, and I've not found them all, Tim. Yeah. You, you know, um, I'm, I'm telling, the way I try to tell it my students, 
I think I found a mountain range that other people haven't seen, but I don't know how far the mountain range reaches. And, you know, some of these examples are stronger than others. I think I found some of the stronger ones, but I, I'm sure there is more. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it that way too, it, it also, you mentioned, you know, that have a, an appreciation for, for Greek poetry and Greek literature, but it also, I think, brings you back, like when, when a lot of people leave Christianity, they're, they're like this, whether they're doing it because they're reading some of your books or other, other things, uh, or they're just fed up with, you know, kids dying of cancer at three years old, whatever, whatever the reason is that you left and you realize this just, this doesn't sound re like reality anymore. I'm, I'm done with this. Whatever your reasons are, a lot of us go through a phase, I think, I don't, I don't think I personally went through it, but a lot of people go through a phase where they're just like, this Bible thing is so ridiculous. This is so stupid. And when you kind of go in dangerous right yeah, now. Yeah, for sure. But when you when you step back from that edge a little bit and say, This book is so stupid, and you take your time to get over your <laughs> angry atheist phase and blah blah blah, and you start to just heal, you know, slow yourself back down, figure out what you know what reality is, you start to get regrounded, and then you take a fresh look at it after a while. And you're like, you know what, this book, if I'm going to take it as a literal word from a literal Canaanite deity who had a son named Jesus, yes, that's garbage. But this is a pretty amazing book. I mean, when you figured that they're doing, you mentioned, you know, the Greek epics obviously is a huge piece of this. You also mentioned their Moses where they're rewriting a lot of the, the mimesis, the Old Testament. Then you weave, you're weaving in things um, such as Pythagoreanism. There's stuff where they're copying from Josephus. I've seen some evidence they're copying from Plutarch. A lot of other stuff, um, Gematria. You, you take the stuff and you're like, these guys are pretty clever. And I, I wonder if it was like in phases where like somebody said, I'm your Gematria guy. I will weave in the magic numbers with the words. Someone else said, I, Pythagoreanism, you know, was my deal. I want to put that in. Someone else is like, hey, I read, I read Homer for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We got to weave Homer all over this thing. And someone else is doing something else. But when you, whether it was one person or a group of people or just iterations, by the time that it comes down to us, there are layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of dozens and dozens of different things that are woven in here. And yeah, as a literal gospel from a literal God, it's stupid. But as a literary work, it's brilliant. It really is. And you begin to see it with fresh eyes and say, I can actually, for the first time in my life, having already read it for decades, I can now read it for the first time for real. Paul Ricoeur uses psychological theory to talk about what he, to talk about a first naivete and a second naivete. The first naivete breaks up when you start thinking about it and it deconstructs. But there's a way of owning these things that is no longer uncritical, but and it's not naive. So the, the nomenclature isn't helpful, but you you get over the pain and all of a sudden, then you see the beauty again. And that's what you're describing. That's what Recur was trying to describe. And it really is a part of cognitive development. The same way children go from believing in Santa Claus to not believing in Santa Claus to believing in Santa Claus for their children. You know, it's um, you own Santa Claus as a parent in a way that you would never when you were a 13 year old uh, snot and you already know that Santa Claus doesn't exist. Yep, exactly. Well, well said. I was curious as you as you, you mentioned you know that there's more to this do you do you think there's any other major influences besides what you've come across like do you have any just i don't mean something you would identify for me or for anyone who's just a sneaking suspicion do you think there's some other major secretive things woven in here that we just haven't uncovered yet Um, Specifically, what I'm fishing for is like I, I, I'm I'm starting to dig it. For example, into Gematria and Pythagoreanism. Um, Bill Darlison, if you're familiar with his work, uh, the Gosp the Zodiac and the Gospels, talking about how the Gospel of Mark is structured according to the signs of the Zodiac in the right order, the constellations. Like what? 
are there things that you're finding where you're thinking there might be other layers to this besides just the Greek epics? I'm going to say no without being dogmatic. Gotcha. Um, and it goes like this. I don't think what these authors are doing are esoteric. I think they're politically charged. I think they're trading on the great traditions of Greek culture um, and engaging Virgil's Aeneid um, indirectly, but attempts to see um, esotericism, Gematria would be an example, or this is one reason I'm a little skeptical about the Anarchic stuff, because pe some people uh, think then these readers are, you know, esoteric and they've got this uh, Anarchic stuff in the closet. The only place where I find a possible esotericism, and I don't even know that I'd call it that, it has to do with elements of Mithras and, um, and the Mithras cult. But the Mithras cult was known in antiquity, even though it was a mystery. Um, but there are a couple of places where one wonders if people are aware of, uh, of Mithras. So, uh, and some people who are interested in esotericism and, you know, that you have privileged readers who have a common esoteric commitments uh, have liked my work. I wish I could say I like theirs as much. So there you have it. I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm yep. just saying I don't think these texts are written to be in a closet. And I don't think they're written for private eyes. I really think they're trying to make larger cult, they're, they're evoking larger cultural um, structures. Fair enough, fair enough. But I, I feel like at the very least um, your work, if people really get it, I mean, they really read your books and study them and they're not easy. Some of it's not easy. You have to read it a couple of times true. and think yeah. about it. And especially I'm sure with the, the volumes you're coming out with, but this is a, just a great, great place for people. I think who, who truly want to say, I just, I want to come at it with fresh eyes and understand where this book came from and kind of a, I know I've kept you for a while, so I'll make this my last big question. Then you can kind of take the sort of share anything else you want to sh uh, share before we wrap up. But as you, as I dive into this, to me, it seems like there's no way that anyone could not see the truth and the reality of what you've you pointed out here, that they are imitating other epics, other classics, other poetry. But I, I saw one of your recent um, debates and I'll have a link to that as well if anyone wants to see it, but so many recent debates. And so bringing it up here, the question of, of Christians, um, fundamentalist Christians, literalist Christians, a lot of us would love to talk to Christians about these topics. And yet the walls feel like they're 100 feet high and you know 10 feet thick. Um, they, they want to just put their fingers in their ears or they want to say this isn't true. I know you faced a lot of criticism, um, which I believe is just beyond ridiculous. Um, what you've done is pure gold to me. And, but yet I understand why they're doing it because there is a fundamental threat in the sense that if, if what you're saying is true and, and is accurate, that they're overwhelmingly imitating Greek literature then that means that the Jesus stories aren't literally true. They are imitations of other mythologies, other poetry, which means that what they're swinging out into eternity over as or is, you know, I'm sure you've seen those pictures of the tracks, you know, here's, here's the earth and here's heaven, you need a cross, but imagine it instead as like a, you know, Spider-Man's, you know, uh, web. He's, you know, you're swinging out over the flames of hell as it were, and this, this rope that's going to get you to the other side, to the other bank side of, of death, to the banks of Jordan, is I know Jesus and the gospel is the truth. And that's what's going to save me. And so when you see this stuff, when they see this stuff and they, they see the implications, not just like, okay, there's a parallel here, there's a parallel here, he's quoting this and he's quoting here. But there's, 
beyond the facts of the of the data of where it's being imitated from there there's an inherent there's like a thread an underlying thread almost like a dormant volcano that's where it's we think it's quiet on the surface but it's actually bubbling hot on the on the on the bottom side and it's going to erupt at some point and the eruption is your whole worldview is utterly incorrect you have you have completely based your life on a fantasy and so how do you approach that with people who i mean i guess do you approach it with a lot of people do you do you, do you just say some people just aren't ready to hear this is it just too much for some people but for the people that are willing to approach it a little bit how do you get past some of the initial pushback where they they just say i just don't think that's true i don't think this is reality i, I mean i know jesus is real. i know the gospel is real and maybe even the idea of other people would have seen it by now blah 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 all the objections how do you get fundamentalists to engage in the conversation i'm going to answer in three ways the first is what is my gift to mythicists um, in engaging in that conversation uh, mythicism usually it, is, it comes out of a kind of a skepticism. Um, and in this case, these myths are not just kind of in the air and manufactured by visions and hallucinations and so on. We actually can see what are the models that people use to rewrite these stories. So um, I would hope that your viewers who are mythicists I'm not a mythicist, but mythicists like uh, Richard Carrier can use my stuff to say, now we know where these myths are coming from, because we can see that this is a part of a literary project that these communities are using. The second answer I'm going to give to you is, uh, and by the way, I'm not successful in dealing with fundamentalists, because, you know, I'm persona non grata, thank you. But um, Another way to understand it, though, is social identity theory. These people, like at Bob Jones, are told that God is on their side, and they have certain social identity markers that they use, certain social conformity, being against gay marriage, being against intermar interracial marriage, um, American jingoism, legitimacy of violence, and so on. And that has a cohesiveness to them, and it allows them to have what are called high social boundary um, maintenance, so that they need to maintain their identity against the outsider. And so then you have stereotyped outsiders like myself, and probably now like you, who are um, then demonized. And you know, you're of the the you're. And there's biblical precedents for it. You're of the father of the devil. He was a liar from the beginning and so on. So social identity theory is really helpful in understanding why people have these investments in things that for us are so illogical. They're logical sociologically because they have this social identity. They have, we, they have common um, outgroup uh, identity and so on. Now, and it causes them then to accept, un, um, to reject inconvenient truths. This happens in science. Think about anti-vaxxers or um, people who don't, who accept the president who lies uh, periodically or, or almost perpetually and hides documents and fights the law. You know, this, it, it's self-justifying. Now, so that, I think, is an explanation of why you have this retribalization of American culture and these high boundary maintenance and the, and the stereotyping and really demonizing of the outsider because you don't have the, and the Bible then gets used among some to be the, the revealed word of God and we're defending the Bible and Christian tradition against everybody else. It's very unfortunate. Now, the third way of dealing with it is the hardest, Tim, to make friendships and to say, can you tell me why this is important to you? Can you tell me how, what you would do with these things that, you, that I would consider inconvenient for, truths for you? 
what about these parallels of gods walking on water or visiting the dead or the gods abandoning heroes and so on? Now, and one way to get around it is to say, look, I, I'm undecided on some of these things, but this asshole Dennis McDonald thinks that some of it's coming from Greek poetry. What do you think about that? How, do, how, would, how would you digest that? And so on. But I think so much of it has to be done now. And again, this is from an atheist, pastorally, from friendship, from listening, from um, putting inconvenient truths and, and so on and facts in front of people and giving them a chance to think about it. Unfortunately, we are so polarized now that we don't talk to each other and we don't have bridges for doing it. So those are the three responses. One, I think uh, mythicists now have more ammunition than we had in the past, than they had in the past, for saying where these myths come from. The second is that we have now an assembly of inconvenient truths that require people to, to wrestle with them. But the third is as important as anything, uh, friendship, dialogue, um, and struggle, I guess. A good answer. I, <clears throat> I really appreciate that. And that's, it's a good point because there's, there's a lot of these conversations where you'd love to have them. You'd love to dialogue and, and even not in, in a belligerent sense, like, oh, your religion is so, so stupid, this or that. It's just so, so made up. Um, but just to say, like, let's just, that's honestly dialogue about the, um, about the source of this stuff, because I have some honest questions. I think what's hard is one of the things that's recently come at me, and I'm sure you've had versions of this, is the idea that, remember, there are verses where it talks about the, the natural man can't understand the things of the Spirit of God, and, um, you know, God reveals things, but you know, if you're in the flesh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get it. Basically, um, the the things of the spirit are foolishness to you. And the idea has been portrayed to me recently by some loved ones that you can't, like, you literally, if you've walked away from the Bible, if you've walked away from the Bible as your source of truth, from Jesus as the Lord and Savior, then you truly have no ability left to rightly divide the word of truth, as it were, to rightly interpret the Bible anymore. You have walked away from your, you've disqualified yourself from ever interpreting the Bible. And I just say that as a, as a comment to say it's, it's very troubling, these conversations, and maybe just to bring in, into it this, the aspect of, of stepping away from academia for a second and just saying, you know, there are some people in, in, in families and, you know, marriages with issues with their kids or their parents, where the, these th theories, these these really amazing academic insights, they they go from being really cool YouTube videos to watch and really cool notes to take to sources for daggers that go into our backs by our loved ones. And there's a lot of people hurting purely because they've re they've realized this stuff isn't real. And I just wanted to encourage those people as, as you're listening i understand that we're talking about this as just you know more factual but i also understand there's an emotional side of this some of you have deconverted because of realizing information like this and lots of other information compared to mythology and you are now in a whirlwind of hate in a lot of cases because um, they treat you like a basically like a traitor you're a traitor to the gospel to the, to the lord yeah. Describe that in terms of social identity theory. You're in the outside group now. You're, you're in the outside group now. Yeah. The inside group has to maintain its cohesiveness and its reliability. Yeah. And so what you're facing now is outgroup stereotyping. Yeah. Nobody in the outgroup can understand these things. And so how the people who do a social identity interpretation say social identity is the way humans are wired we're not going to get rid of it but what we need to do for these groups is to lower the boundaries between the in-group and the out-group 
This is one of the things that liberal Protestants have tried to do to lower that. So they have a Christian identity, but they're willing to be assimilated to larger society and to accept other religions and so on. So that it's not so that those social identity boundaries are permeable and can be lowered. So instead of making them mythicists, I think the issue is to um, appeal to generosity and to uh, open and to, to, my guess is that you're, you, in your family, you are going to be more respected for being a loving father than being an intellectual. Mm -hmm. So be a loving father. Yeah. Bingo. Well said. Well said. Hopefully, um, just like uh, I think it's one of the Peters, first or second Peter talks about if you have a an unbelieving spouse, win them back with your with your good behavior. Hopefully, there we, you we go. Can work there you work go. both ways. A little win, wisdom there. Yeah. 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 Win, win them to the uh, other side as well. Well, um, I know I've asked you a lot of questions and, and I've kept you late, late there and it's uh, probably eating into your dinner time here. Uh, but um, I did want to just give you the floor if you had anything else you wanted to add. I, I, by the way, I have, a, I have a lot more questions, but I think a lot of my questions I'm going to have to save till I've really done some more digging and can really, really bring some of this, uh, some insights that I hopefully capture from your work to the table and ask some better, better questions. So I definitely don't mean to say I've got no questions for you. I've got dozens of questions for you to save, but for, for a future interview. But for now, I did just want to say, um, you know, did you have anything else for, for what we talked about tonight that you wanted to add? I want to make a, a meta comment about um, podcasts and um, podcasts like your own and like Myth Vision and others. I think this is a much more vital church and religious experience than anything you're going to get in the local church in your, in your home, uh, hometown. So now we can be more global in our reach and in our learning from each other and our valuing these texts. I value these, I love these texts. And I'm so angry that they're so misunderstood and abused, even in sometimes a counter to the moral vision of the authors. So I just want to applaud what you and Derek and Edward and Jacob and others are doing. You're creating a, a network of people with similar uh, commitments. And, um, and it's, it, it's really vital to what, you know, to, to, to in these culture wars. It really is a very important thing. Yeah, thank you for saying so. And I, it does, I will just piggyback off that and say it's it's a real privilege, uh, obviously on my side to be the the one of the hosts of, of a platform like that, but also it's it's just a privilege to, number one, to be passively listening to so many of these stories, because I do often, um, for a lot of my interviews so far, they're less about the academic side of it, and they're more about just people's stories step by step, um, you know, the theology they believed in, inerrancy, and purity culture, and, you know, fearing of fearing hell, fearing angels and demons and so forth. But one of the be most beautiful things I love about doing this is you get people that you realize they have a story and, and a platform like this and many others, it, it sends the message that your story matters. Like yeah, not just- And it's not unique. Yeah, exactly. It's not unique. And, and, and yet there's uniquenesses to, to that. Like, I, I think so, certain personalities will hit. So I'm like, I, I, I can sense that some people will respond to me when I say, I really want to interview you. And they'll say, oh, my story is boring. And by the time we do the interview, it's like come to light and details have come out. And I can tell that there's certain people that are going to watch my show where I could mention something and it might sound interesting, but it's not going to really hit them where they're at. But that person I interviewed who's very, you know, their unique story is going to go right to their heart in a way that I can't ever do. And I, I love that. And I love, I love people feeling like their stories mean something. And because yeah. I think so much of us too feel like when we leave, our time was so wasted. It was just like, it's so, it's such a waste of time what we did. And it's like, yes, but to, again, to borrow a biblical phrase, let's redeem the time. You know, let's take what, what was, what was used as evil against us and use it for good. 
after I go quote and all this stuff. Uh, years, decades of memorizing huge chunks of scripture. We'll do that to you. But, um, you know, just taking what we've been through and saying, let's use it to make a difference for the next generation there you go. There by you telling go. our stories. There you go. Anyway. Well, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Um, I love love your work. I, I want to make sure everyone understands if it's not clear. Uh, you are one of my personal heroes. Um, <laughs> and I'm so privileged to have spoken with you today. And I, I look forward to seeing your your uh, volumes there that you mentioned coming out and just hopefully creating waves and tsunamis of impact because this is this is amazing stuff. So thank you for the, you, I'm sure, years and years of, of quiet work that you've done and the back office when nobody was, <clears throat> excuse me, when nobody was looking, when nobody was aware of how important this work was. And I'm sure you just kept on plugging away. And at this point, the fruit of your labors is just abundant. So I'm, I'm so, so grateful for what you've been doing for, for you're, decades you're, now. Tim, you're, you're really far too kind. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I look forward to uh, interviewing you again. Hopefully I've got a lot of questions. We'll, we'll save them for the next time, but thank you again. It's been great to get to know you. And um, hopefully, hopefully we can uh, dive deeper next time. I hope so too. Okay, take care. Thank you so much.